After two months, Singapore's circuit breaker aimed at putting the brakes on the spread of COVID-19 is finally lifted. But if you imagine life would pivot back to normal, well, it won't. We have evolved a three-phase roadmap to take us forward. So phase one is a safe opening. In this phase, you are still going to see this. Most shops will remain closed. You still can't eat out. There'll be very limited visits to grandparents and students to return to school in a staggered manner. Phase two is a safe transition period. The second phase, which could happen as early as this month, will see the resumption of some social activities, like dining and sports, but with safe distancing measures still at play. And phase three, the safe Singapore. This final step sees a new normal, where all social, cultural and religious gatherings can resume, but group sizes must be limited. There will still be measures in place to prevent widespread transmission of COVID-19. Community infections have dropped since circuit breaker measures were put in place. So why do we have to lift restrictions so carefully? Singapore is not alone in attempting a cautious reopening. Countries like Germany and South Korea are also gingerly easing restrictions that lasted for nearly two months. The reason for the slow pace? The fear that there will be a second wave of the virus spreading. People like Associate Professor Alex Cook are trained to simulate how the virus would spread when Singapore reopens. He looks at previous virus hotspots and crunches data that charts out how a virus will spread. The government uses this data to determine how quickly to lift measures. How real is this risk of a second wave of infection? I think it's a, it's a very real risk. A lot of countries are worried about it. The virus in, it is inherently quite a transmissible virus, but I think there's another reason why we would be cautious about reopening, and that is because it, it acts in a way almost like a kind of a third venue for increasing the amount of contacts between different parts of the population. You can imagine that during lockdown, you're at home, and then in a semi-relaxed post-lockdown period, you're at home and you're at work. So you're coming into contact with these, these two groups of people that are pretty much the same people every time. <laughs> now, you open a third venue on top of that, so that it could be shopping centers, it could be the church or something then that is now bringing you into contact with not just more people, but people that you would not normally have come into contact with. Mm -hmm. and therefore, you're increasing the amount of connectivity in the population as a whole, and therefore allowing for more propagation of, of disease. The population is, at least in Singapore, is nowhere near the level of herd immunity. Herd immunity means that you're getting protected from infection because people around you have already been infected. The best way to defeat a virus is through immunity. When certain viruses spread through a population, some infected people die, but others survive. For these survivors, their immune systems have learned to recognize and fight off the virus. When most of the population obtains this immunity, the virus struggles to spread and eventually dies out. This is called herd immunity. To achieve natural herd immunity, at least 50% of the population would need to have been infected. Obviously, this risks a very high death toll and it will take a very long time. Even in Wuhan, the first epicenter of the virus, it's estimated that only 2% of the population are immune to COVID-19. So, is there a faster way to protect people? The answer is yes. Since the emergence of COVID-19, scientists around the world have been scrambling to find a vaccine. Which is why all eyes are on infectious disease experts like Associate Professor Su Li Yang. But he's not confident that an effective COVID-19 vaccine can be developed within the year. We have never developed a successful coronavirus vaccine ever. And that's because the human coronaviruses 
cause just mild cold and nobody bothers to make a vaccine for that. Whereas for SARS, the disease disappeared, so there was no need for a vaccine as well. And for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is also caused by a coronavirus, the vaccine has just reached clinical testing at this point. So we have no track record against coronaviruses when it comes to developing vaccines. So even if we do have a vaccine, what is the best that the world can hope for? I think if we do have a safe and effective vaccine, and let's just say even if the immunity doesn't last a long time, we can be revaccinated every few years. Like now, every year we go for the flu vaccine, right? Um, in that case, we will still be able to considerably reduce the number of infections and deaths caused by COVID-19. And that may be the best outcome that we can hope for in the next few years. If they succeed, how soon do you think a vaccine will reach the market? I think the earliest, even if all the different clinical trials and development process go smoothly, we are looking at 2021 at the earliest when we will have a vaccine. And don't forget that um, when a successful vaccine gets developed, manufacturing still has to be ramped up for large numbers of people. And there will be many countries in the queue to try to obtain the vaccine. So it could be quite a long wait. So a solution in the next few months is out of the question. This virus is here to stay, at least for another year. Are we prepared for the long haul? More importantly, when can I travel with my family again? I'm getting some answers from one of the country's key leaders. Most countries have adopted a hammer and dance approach to contain COVID-19. The hammer comes in hard and fast to fight the first wave of infections. Once the numbers are down, the dance begins. This is the slow opening of the economy that is constantly calibrated based on how the virus is spreading. Open gradually and we may be able to emerge as New Zealand did. The country went through a 33-day lockdown that ended on 27th April. New Zealand is easing restrictions after a month-long lockdown. Focusing first on reopening businesses and then schools for students up to the age of 15. Recreational activities opened a month later. As a result, the number of confirmed cases dropped steadily to an average of just one a day. But open too fast and you might end up like the Japanese island of Hokkaido. After a three-week lockdown, when an average of five cases were reported daily, the government lifted all restrictions on March 19th. The virus returned swiftly. In just three weeks, the number of cases shot up to an average of 15 a day. On Monday, Hokkaido reimposed a state of emergency after lifting restrictions less than a month ago. Hokkaido went into a second lockdown. So gingerly lifting restrictions does seem to bring about better results. But it makes me wonder about the price we have to pay for our economy, which is already in tatters. For some answers, I'm calling Irvin Sia, who has been analysing the implications of the circuit breaker on our economy. How urgent is it for us to get the economy up and running again? The heat, the impact on the economy is significant. If you're talking about contractions of 5.7%, this is more than double the worst recession prior to COVID-19. So this is going to be the worst that we have ever seen. Yes, we will see a spike up in terms of retrenchment. And also, many workers may also lose their jobs when companies go belly up. So the economy needs to restart. But on the other hand, we also have worries about spikes in infection or risks of that. How does the society strike the balance? 
this is a very difficult uh, decision, involves significant amount of trade-off. We have seen that happening in some countries like China, Korea and Germany, where they are now confronted with the risk of a second wave of infections. I think the last thing that policymakers they want to see is another spike up in terms of number of infections or more fatality. I mean, we're talking about people's life involved. And I think this is very important, which is why the healthcare considerations takes precedence compared to the economic costs. This pandemic is challenging countries to make a difficult choice, economy or health. As a Singaporean, we can't live without bubble tea. I miss eating out with my family and watching movies with them. I'm doing advertising for businesses. It's a lot easier if I can meet my clients face-to-face uh, -face than to do it over a Zoom call. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I even miss family gatherings where you're only meeting up with people that you only see once or twice a year, a few times a year, and uh, you always have to answer those very personal questions thrown at you by those uh, Kepo relatives because that was a time where, you know, everyone was having fun. I miss my gym training as I can see my friends and my coaches and I can improve on my skills. I do training at home but I can't really remember the steps sometimes so I'll try to remember. We, we want to get back in, get the, get the training in. So yeah man, get those gyms open ASAP. Such comments probably aren't new to the man I'm about to meet. In January, a ministerial task force was set up to tackle the pandemic. Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh manages the business sector. I want to know how difficult was it for him to walk the tight rope between health and economy. Many countries are faced with a very difficult choice. They have to choose between saving lives or saving the economy. How did we decide? I just want to make this uh, very uh, simple point. Uh, many people keep thinking about when can we go back to the pre-COVID world. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we will ever go back to the pre-COVID because we will need one, if not two things. One could be a vaccine so that everybody can get vaccinated and then we can live life normally again. Now, short of a vaccine, the other possibility is that we have a rapid test kit, uh, something that is not so invasive, something that is not so expensive, something as straightforward like a pregnancy test kit whereby you can take a sample of a body fluid, put it on a strip of paper, and then perhaps in uh, 15 minutes, half an hour, we can get a result. Now, if we can achieve that, then we can resume travel we can also resume many of the usual activities. But that, I think, is going to take some time. Some people feel that there is more emphasis on mm. health as compared to the health of the economy. How mm. do you personally feel about it? It's not mutually exclusive. If we don't get the health situation right, we can't restart the economy properly. And we cannot resume travel and we cannot inspire confidence in other people to work with us. So it's closely intertwined. If we have rushed to reopen everything and suddenly we find clusters popping up everywhere, then it's very hard to contain them and then we probably have to shut down everything again. It's actually much more disruptive. Can we afford a second circuit breaker? If we have to do it, we have to do it. But our aim is not to get to a circuit breaker. That's why we resume our activities progressively so that we don't have to get into a second circuit breaker. Which of the businesses will be some of the last uh, to be allowed to resume service? There are some businesses that will really need a new business model uh, because it involves large group gatherings. So for example, uh, social entertainment outlets, for example, large-scale sports event. What about travel? Mm. When will we get to travel again? I think there are two parts to it. For business travel, for essential business travel, we are looking at resumption with countries that are of similar standards with us that we can agree on a reciprocal protocol for accepting each other's travellers. So I think that will come about faster than the second part, which is the mass market travel. For the mass market travel, I think again, <coughs> we can break it down into two parts. I think it will probably start off with the higher value add niche market where people are looking for the non-mass market options. People are travelling in smaller groups. Uh, people are going to have more unique packages designed for them. That is likely to resume first rather than the mass market uh, big group tour.
tour that we used to see in the past. In terms of travel for leisure, will that happen by the end of the year? Um, hopefully so, but uh, because of so many variables in the equation, yeah, it will be a bit too premature for us to, to have a definitive date at this point in time. A lot of people are anticipating that the elections will be coming soon. Do you think it makes sense to hold it in Phase 2 or Phase 3? Well, Parliament will have to be dissolved by January 2021 and without a Parliament, we won't be able to pass uh, the bills necessary to manage the crisis. And the latest we can hold an election will be three months after the uh, dissolution of Parliament and that will be in April. We are at a stage of our nation's history where we have never been before. The last time we ever had a situation like this where there's such a sharp drop in our economic output, sharp rise in our unemployment, would hark back to the British withdrawal east of the Suez in the 1967-68 where my grandparents were working in a Sambawang naval base. So we are facing the crisis of a generation and when, if and when we go to the polls, I think we will put the case before fellow Singaporeans about having a strong, coherent leadership team to take the country forward, not just to overcome the current crisis, but also to put us in a good stead in the longer term, uh, competing with other nations to create, to attract the investment and create good jobs for our people. Phase 3 will remain until a vaccine is found. Say, if that happens, yeah. there's going to be intense global competition for mm. the vaccines. How can Singaporeans be sure that we can get our hands on the vaccines? Yeah. So we are working with uh, various partners to see whether they can uh, locate some parts of the production in Singapore. So we become part of the global supply chain and then we will be able to produce the vaccine and share it with the rest of the world. So to ensure we get the vaccine the moment it's ready, we must be part of the vaccine production process. I'm heartened to know that Singapore's biomedical manufacturing sector is already working on it. But till then, life as we know it will change. But if you think you're having a hard time, just imagine what it's like for your elderly parents. No going out, no shopping, no buying things. But then, who's going out to buy the things? One of the reasons for a cautious easing of our restrictions is because we need to protect our most vulnerable, our seniors. Throughout the circuit breaker, I've been delivering food to my mother and now I've been told that she still cannot visit my home under phase one. Now this is something that she misses dearly. Day-to-day -day activities for senior citizens will only resume in phase three and it may take several months for this to happen. A few days after this uh, circuit breaker requirement, I realised that I have lost internet connectivity. No wonder I didn't hear from my friends for days. I thought they were depressed. I realised that I was an idiot when it comes to technology. Oh, I would love to meet my friend for the badminton game and also eating with my friends. I miss my laughter yoga groups. Laughing at home with Zoom is different. You don't have the freedom to travel and visit your family and friends and mingle with them. When my children came over just before the circuit breaker, they keep saying, no going out, no shopping, no buying things. But then who's going out to buy the things? Who's going to get all the food on the table if no one's going out? The difficult things for me for this circuit breaker, I cannot go out as well for my marketing my friends cannot uh, chit-chat with them anymore. I wonder if there is a way for seniors like my mother to experience this human connection while still remaining safe. To find out, I'm speaking to Assistant Professor Rahul Malhotra, a specialist in caring for the elderly. The data within Singapore is showing that majority of the, the fatalities belong to the elderly. How should policy makers then approach this age group? Studies have shown that in addition to age, it is also the presence of chronic health conditions 
such as diabetes, such as hypertension, such as chronic respiratory conditions, say bronchitis or asthma, that put individuals at risk. In other countries, uh, clearly individuals who are less than 60 but have chronic health conditions which are not well controlled or have two or more chronic health conditions also have a greater risk of severe COVID conditions uh, or dying because of COVID. And a lot of those younger people would be up and about when the restrictions ease. And if they don't follow the measures, they would be bringing the infection back home. And the purpose of keeping an older person at home safe from getting infected is lost. So I think we would have to think about creative ways. I think one measure that has recently been considered in a few European countries like Germany and Belgium and in New Zealand is to form a kind of social bubbles. And these would be a group of, say, 10 individuals who just interact with each other and in, don't interact with anybody else. And the whole idea is that since they're not interacting with individuals beyond the number of people that would have to be quarantined or have a chance of infection would be a very limited small number. Seeing that Singapore is quite different from these countries that you've mentioned, I mean, we are very densely populated compared to New Zealand, for example. We may need to think of our own creative solutions. I think we see that in some other countries. There are some countries, I think, in the UK where they're trying wristbands to be placed on individuals such that the wristband starts beeping in case you are close to somebody and you are kind of not uh, maintaining a safe distance, if you may. Uh, so, so these kind of technological solutions may be helpful as restrictions are opened up to maybe remind individuals to maintain distancing. This pandemic has presented us with the challenge of making difficult choices, health versus economy. And for our seniors, it's health versus human interaction. I never thought that I would have to plan my life in phases post-circuit breaker. But now I understand why we need to do so, so that we can all come out of the pandemic stronger. Life won't be the same for some time, but I'm celebrating the small things. Because at least for now, I can visit my mother. <laughs>